All right, let's explore anti-lipemic drugs and their relationship to the concept of perfusion. Students are often confused as to why we're studying these drugs when we're studying also drugs that have to do with uh, blood pressure and cardiac uh, arrhythmias or you know, perfusion in general. Let's see if I can clear up a little bit of that confusion. So first of all, if you know your patho, you'll understand cholesterol. I'm not gonna um, go into all of that right now, but the key to understanding how these drugs work is going to be your knowledge about pathology of lipid abnormalities and how they contribute to coronary heart disease. So really pay attention to pathophys about lipids and cholesterol, triglycerides, that will absolutely help you to understand how the drugs work. Um, at the cellular level, you need to understand the transport and the use of cholesterol and triglycerides. So we need them in our bodies. We're supposed to have some cholesterol and triglycerides. So they're produced by our body, endogenous cholesterol, and it's transported to the cells. But then there's exogenous sources as well. And those are the ones that can be troublesome. Lipoproteins, apolipoproteins, receptors, and enzyme systems are all parts of this process. Again, you'll need to review that patho, but we're gonna talk about why we use anti-lipemic drugs in the concept of perfusion. A little bit more about lipoproteins. We have very low density lipoproteins, which are really not that bad. They are produced by our liver and they transport our endogenous lipids to the cells. So we really should have some of those. Then we have low density lipoproteins and high density lipoproteins. You've probably heard of this as LDL and HDL. So the LDL, we like to remember that as the lousy like, um, lipoprotein or the lousy cholesterol. You don't want a lot of low density lipoprotein. And I'll show you what happens with low density lipoprotein in a picture. High density lipoprotein is the lipoprotein that actually takes the cholesterol and recycles it. It makes, it keeps using it. It's known as the good cholesterol. So we want something that keeps reusing. Imagine the landfill, if you will, and a bunch of plastic bottles. And you just keep throwing the plastic bottles in there and eventually that landfill is going to get full and nobody can get through there. Nothing can get through there and it blocks everything. But if we recycled all those bottles and got them out of there, they wouldn't sit there and cause a blockage. So that's why we like our HDL. Here's your low density lipoprotein within the vascular system of the body. The red, are the red blood cells flowing through, it's your blood. This part that kind of looks like it might be something from a bakery, it looks, you know, you can think of lamadolins there, is actually your low density lipoprotein. And it has caused plaque formation. And what did it cause? It causes narrowing. And you might've heard in the old days, they called it narrowing of the arteries was atherosclerotic disease. And it really visually, it is a narrowing, but it's so much more than that. Um, what happens is, you see how it's within the lining here, is where it happens, and it causes this part of the vessel to become very stiff and hard, so it's no longer flexible like a rubber band or a balloon, and it can't um, uh, respond to changes in blood volume and um, perfusion changes the way a, a vascular system, that an arterial system that doesn't have this plaque can do. Um, also, it creates a very sticky inflammation here. So if something is being pushed out like this, you can imagine it's going to get very inflamed. And um, inflammation has its own set of issues, but that then causes more blood to stick in here, the platelets, causing more of a blockage. So you have the, the plaque itself pushing in, whoops, pushing in on the vessel and then within that pushing in within the blockage you'll have more blockage and thrombus formation. This picture should perfectly tell you why this category of drugs is in perfusion because if we don't address this problem, this blockage, the perfusion issues are going to continue. You can probably imagine the impact this has on blood pressure 
as the body has this type of problem throughout. And let's remember, this is a systemic problem. It doesn't just happen in one artery or one vessel. If it's happening in one place, it's happening throughout the entire body. So it's one thing to have to see this type of um, blockage and decreased perfusion in the lower extremities, but it's quite another to see it happening in your carotid arteries that lead to the brain and feed the brain all of its nutrients and oxygen, or the heart, or the pulmonary arteries, or the kidneys. So just remember, if it's happening in one part of the body, it is happening in the entire body. And usually when you see it um, to, the, to an extent, like let's say this is 80 to 90% um, of a problem here, it's going to be that way in all of the arteries. It's a burden on the entire body. And now um, this is a look at atherosclerosis and what happens within the uh, endothelium here of the vessel we just kind of talked about. And you can see down here the progression from a normal vessel with just a little damage here, just, you know, they're starting to have a buildup of plaque. And now you have plaque accumulation and you can see how that impacts perfusion. And now you have a narrow lumen coming here as well. Um, here's a normal artery going more to the right here on the picture. And then we have it narrowed by the plaque formation. Now up here in the, um, coronary arteries, it is showing atherosclerosis and the formation of a blood clot as a result of atherosclerosis. So um, it's showing you that picture there. So getting uh, these drugs into these patients to help reduce the amount of atherosclerosis is going to increase perfusion. It's going to increase oxygen transport to the, all of the organs, all of the extremities. It's going to decrease problems with um, resist, vascular resistance, which impacts blood pressure. And it's going to increase perfusion and to the brain and to the heart and reduce the possibility of a cardiovascular event and a cerebral vascular event, heart attack or stroke. So actually the risk of coronary heart disease in patients that have cholesterol levels of 300 milligrams per deciliter or higher is three to four times greater than that in somebody who has a level of less than 200 milligrams. So you can see where our goal starts to be when we want to give um, and pharmacologically treat hypercholesterol. We will want, so this is gonna be our goal to get them down below 200. So there's been um, a lot of guidelines that have come out. This has been well studied and well documented. And we know that um, anti-lipemic drugs are used to lower lipid levels and as an adjunct to diet and actually lifestyle therapy. So what that means is on the last bullet here, you see all reasonable non-drug means of controlling blood cholesterol levels should be tried for at least six months and found to fail before drug therapy is considered because drug therapy is not without its own risks. But we want to, what that means is we need people to move. They don't have to do aerobic exercise. They don't have to do CrossFit. They don't have to do boot camp. They need to walk. They need to get out and walk. And moving their blood and doing that helps to increase HDL levels and increase transport and recycling of the cholesterol in their body. So we really encourage a moderate diet and watching their, I mean, exercise, moderate exercise and watching their diet and trying to avoid those exogenous forms of really bad low density lipoproteins such as french fries and fried chicken and um, all the yummy fried foods like you know fried uh, spring rolls and egg rolls and um, just all of those things that are so delicious but are so high in those horrible uh, low density lipoproteins and I mean, but it really needs to happen. Otherwise, even giving them the medications is only gonna be partially successful. So on this list, these are all different classes of antilipemics, not just one. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's more coming out every day. And within these classes, there's even more drugs. Like in the um, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, there's probably like 10 different drugs. We're gonna focus on one. And we're gonna focus on the hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A reductase inhibitors, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. 
or we call them statins. It's just the easiest thing to say. That class is referred to as statins. And so we do know these are the most potent LDL reducers, and these are the ones you're most commonly going to encounter. So what are the indications for these statin drugs? First line therapy for hypercholesterolemia, but as an adjunct to diet and exercise changes. Um, there are different classifications of hyperlipidemias. I'm not going into that right now, but it, you can see um, giving statins can reduce LDL levels by up to 50%, which is really good uh, for that person who has an LDL over 300. We can get them down to hopefully a goal of below 200. They help increase HDL a little bit, but really getting out and walking is going to be the biggest change there. And then triglycerides can come down significantly as well. So how do they work? And this goes back to knowing your pathophysiology and understanding of this, these, and how they come at the cellular level in the body. But basically our statin drugs um, inhibit a reductase which is used by the liver to produce cholesterol. So we're reducing the amount of cholesterol endogenous that the body is producing. And so this lowers the rate of cholesterol production. Beautiful, right? Well, we're targeting the liver. So let's remember if somebody has any kind of organ issues in the liver, they probably can't take one of these statin drugs. So they may have to take one of the others that were on that list. And this also, we need to know that um, we may get problems in the liver, even though the person didn't have problems before, because the liver is targeted. Some of the adverse effects can be some GI disturbances. They're usually mild and transient, and shortly after administration of the drug. Some people can develop a rash or have a headache. Again, this may not need to be a reason to stop the drug, but a physician needs to determine that. The most important problem that can happen is the myopathy, which is called muscle pain. And this can be an indication of rhabdomyolysis, which can be life-threatening. We can also see elevations in liver enzymes or even liver disease. So what is this rhabdomyolysis I just mentioned? It is a breakdown of muscle protein. So if you've ever done heavy exercise, done weight lifts, done a boot camp or something like that, and the next day you couldn't move, or maybe the next two days you can not move because it hurts so bad. That's the release um, of the uh, protein your, in your, from your muscles from damage to the muscles. So um, you, you, take, you drink a lot of water, you try and get all of that out, and then you feel better because your muscles repair. But if you're taking a drug every single day that contributes to breakdown of muscle protein, you're going to feel this, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Well, the problem is, it produces a myoglobinuria, which um, is the elimination of the protein from the muscles. And it, it starts to um, affect the, re the renal system, the kidneys, because it actually is like clogging up the uh, microtubules in the, in the renal system, which can lead to an acute kidney injury, or some people call it acute renal failure, but it's actually AKI, acute kidney injury, which can lead to death. And so it's extremely important that if you, we instruct our patients to immediately report any signs of toxicity and any muscle soreness or change in urine color. Urine color is going to become very concentrated and dark. And um, we need to know about that. Something that doesn't resolve with drinking some more water and then the next time they urinate is clear. Uh, that would simply maybe indicate some dehydration. But this will be constant, it doesn't clear, and it goes along usually with the uh, muscle pain that they have. When it's recognized early, rhabdomyolysis can be reversed. It's reversible, we stop the statin drug, um, support the patient with pain relievers if needed, and give fluids to help the kidneys. And then they can never take statins again, but they can take some of the other classifications on that list. So I have a question for you to wrap this up. So we have a patient with a new prescription for a statin drug, and they're instructed to take the medication with the evening meal or at bedtime. The patient asks why it must be taken at this time of day. What is the nurse's best response? So why don't you read those options there? I'll give you a few seconds to decide which one you think is the best response.
it may appear that they all could be possible answers. And that is the plight of nursing students when they take exams. But there's one here that is actually the best answer. So let's see if you pick it. The right answer is B. Let's go back. B is this time frame correlates better with the natural diurnal rhythm of cholesterol production. So uh, I said you need to know your path though, I meant it. It, made, it makes a difference. So all statins are generally dosed once daily. That's great, it helps with adherence. And usually with the evening meal or at bedtime to best coincide with the body's natural diurnal rhythm of cholesterol production. I hope you got the answer right. If you did, congratulations. If you didn't, you just learned something new. I hope you guys do well and now understand why we put these uh, statin drugs in with perfusion. Good luck, y'all.